Caribe Radio. Nos proponemos ser la emisora online calificada para ser la mejor opción en comunicación para ustedes. Nos preparamos en noticias, deportes, cultura, música y de entretenimiento general para que usted esté conectado todo el tiempo con nosotros. Caribe Radio ofrece el mejor servicio de comunicación digital para que las empresas se hagan visibles a diferentes públicos. Desde lo público, trabajamos para el servicio y por el servicio social. Caribe Radio Online, nos entrenamos día a día para brindar la mejor opción en producción de medios digitales. Caribe Radio, la radio del futuro. Los conceptos, productos y servicios del siguiente espacio son responsabilidad del director del programa y no representan el pensamiento de esta emisora. Good afternoon. This is Discussions with Authors, part of Books Over Drinks, an online community meant to foster the passion for books by providing a platform for both authors and readers to exchange ideas and discuss their work. We're pleased to welcome Dr. Catherine Page Harden. Dr. Harden is a tenure professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas, where she leads the Developmental Behavior Genetics Lab and co-directs the Texas Twin Project. She received her PhD in, a clinic, in clinical psychology from the University of Virginia and has published over 100 scientific articles on genetic influences on complex human behavior, including child cognitive development, academic achieve, achievement, and mental health, mental health. Her research has been focused in popular um, media outlets such as the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, The Atlantic, and Huffington Post. She's joining us today to, to discuss her book, The Genetic Loyalty, Uh, why DNA matters for social equality. The book covers foundational concepts about genetics delivered for a general audience while exploring and explaining the field of genetics in the context of how genetic variances correlate with academic outcomes. An interesting and quite a provocative premise meant to draw our attention to the facts and away from what the author calls the interpretive vacuum that political extremists have been happy to exploit for so long. Dr. Harden, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. We're happy to have you with us. Thank you for inviting me. This is such a pleasure. Great. So um, I don't want to turn this interview into a lecture, but I did want <laughs> us to cover a couple of concepts which uh, you address in the book. Uh, the book centers its premise around findings, findings of GWAS studies. Uh, but what are GWAS and polygenic scores, and how do these help us understand genetic variances between individuals or groups? Yeah, so a GWAS is a genome-wide association study. And what it does is it measures um, hundreds of thousands or millions of what are called SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms. And these are just single letter differences in someone's DNA sequence. So all of our DNA is made up of G, C, T, and A. Um, those are the nucleotides that make up our genome. And so we might differ in one of those letters. You might have a G in a particular spot, whereas I have a T in that particular spot. So that's a variant. That's a polymorphism, poly meaning different, morphism meaning shape. So our DNA looks different in that spot. And these differences between us are small relative to the whole length of the genome. So 99.9% of the genome is exactly the same across all humans. You know, most of our DNA makes us a person um, and it's the same across people. Um, but that 0.1% still means that there's millions of genetic differences between us that are scattered throughout all 23 pairs of our chromosomes. So what a genome-wide association study, a GWAS, is doing is it's measuring those genetic differences between people, um, typically in a lot of people. So in our most recent study, we were measuring um, genetic data on one and a half million people about. And it's correlating each one of those differences with some outcome that you've measured. So if the outcome is height, you're looking and saying, does, you know, people who have the G version of this, are they taller or shorter than people who have the C version of this, for instance? Um, and then, so there's a couple things to note about that. One is that um, all of those correlations are really, really small. So if we're looking at, you know, one single DNA difference between people, 
um, you know, it's not that this DNA variant makes you a foot taller. It doesn't even make you an inch taller. It probably makes you like 0.1 inches taller on average. So it's these tiny effects um, that are changing your probability of an outcome. Um, and then what a polygenic score does is it takes those correlations that you've estimated in the GWAS and applies them to DNA from a new group of people. So I've done a big GWAS over here and a million and a half people. And now I have a sample, let's say it's the sample that, I've, that I collect here in Texas. So I have about 2000 um, kids and teenagers and I measure their DNA and I use the correlations that I estimated in my first study to add up information about their, their genomes into a single number. And we call that number a polygenic score or polygenic index. And again, poly means many. In this case, it's many genes added together into a single, you know, a single variable, a single score, a single number. Um, that's giving you some information about the likelihood of a person um, developing some outcome. So we've done a big genetic study of height, and now we're seeing how many height increasing variants, you know, this new group of people has. Um, what my book is focused on is not the genetics of physical traits like height, but on um, the sorts of things that psychologists typically study. So social, behavioral, psychological outcomes like personality, like how easy do you find school? How far do you go into school? And then because how we do in school is correlated with lots of other things in our lives, um, we end up ultimately connecting genes to these more social inequalities like in education and income. Um, uh, that's, that's what's so fascinating about, about the premise of it. According to your book, twin studies and polygenic indexes have helped measure a direct correlation between genes and a person's academic attainment. But how can something so abstract as a gene or genes can mm -hmm. have an influence over educational attainment, something that seems far more influenced by social aspects? And yeah, yeah. So the keyword that you said there is direct, and it's actually not that direct. You know, what, what our genes are doing Genes code for proteins, right? Like what genes do is that they give your cells instructions to make the proteins that you need for your cell to function. And some of those cells are neurons in our brain. And so, you know, even going from gene to protein to, you know, how your neurons are sharing information with one another um, is already pretty indirect, right? Like we've already gone through several steps here. Um, but we can start to think about how these chains of events go together. So, you know, you have a gene and it codes for a protein and that protein is a receptor that um, uh, is what nicotine binds to when you smoke cigarettes, right? Well, if you like nicotine more, right? If you find it more rewarding, if you find it more anxiety producing, you're going to smoke more. If you smoke as a teenager, are you, that might change who your friends are because kids who are smokers, who do they hang out with as the other smokers, right? So that boundary between biology and behavior and society starts to get blurred together because, you know, we have these more direct effects of our genes on our biology, but then we're going through our lives as, you know, in this so, these social worlds where people are responding to our behavior and we're creating our social environments on the basis of our behavior. So those are not direct. And also they, they're not, it's not nature versus nurture, right? We're thinking about um, genetic effects that often operate through these kind of social factors. Um, and another example is we can think about, you know, some of the genes that are correlated with going further in school um, influence, are you a morning person or are you an, an evening person, right? And you can think about like, well, my kid's school starts at 730 in the morning and I have to drag, like drag them out of bed, like every single day, it's this battle, right? Like you have to get up, you have to get up. We're going to be late to school and I'm doing it all bleary eyed because I'm not a morning person either. Um, so you, we can, we easily think about like, well, our biology affects our, you know, some aspect of our temperament, like, are we a morning person? But then we have a social system that's totally set up for 
you know, the morning people and not the evening people in our society. Like what if school always started at 1 PM your whole life? Like you got to sleep in until 10 AM every day, right? Like your experience of schooling would be different. Um, so we have, you know, this biologically influenced predilection, and then we have a social environment and then there's a match or mismatch between those. And so you can think about how, you know, at every point along the educational process, are you the sort of person that likes to sit still in your classroom? Or are you the sort of person that feels like anxious and edgy if you had to be, you know, sitting still? Like just sitting through this interview is going to make you want, you're going to listen to it while pacing around, right? Those differences matter in how school systems treat us. So that's the argument. It's not that, you know, there's something destined in our genes about our education. It's, um, the systems that we go into, we don't all go into them to, with the same sort of suite of advantages and disadvantages. And those, those biological differences between us matter. They play out over, over the course of our lives. And what would you say, if it's not a sort of like a direct effect of it, what would you say that is the predictive value or how much do these genetic differences matter in the yeah. of a person's um, educational attainment? Yeah, so what we generally see is that the correlations between educational attainment, so just how far you do go in school, did you stop after the end of, before the end of high school, did you go on to college? So the correlation between that and a polygenic index, which again is, you know, a kind of adding up information about your DNA variants, um, it accounts between the, the newest version of the study, it accounts for about 17% of the variants or a correlation that's a little bit greater than, you know, 0.35, you could say 0.4. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, that's not destiny, right? If we're, if we're accounting for 17% of the variance, that leaves 83% of the variation that's not accounted for. On the other hand, it's about as strong as we see correlations between educational attainment and variables like family income. So to the extent that, um, you know, richer children have an advantage in the U.S. in terms of how far they go in school compared to poorer children. We're seeing about a similar type of effect, magnitude of effect, size of an effect, when we're looking at these measured genetic variables. Um, so they're not useless. It's not zero. They're not destiny. They matter about as much as the other kind of um, lotteries of birth that we're used to thinking about um, when we're thinking about social inequality. Now, you mentioned earlier um, correlation, and, and let's yeah. talk about correlation and causation a little yeah. bit. Uh, in your book, you mentioned a study in Estonia, I believe, where a uh, polygenic index from a GWAS um, for educational attainment measured genetic variances related to educational attainment pre and post Soviet occupation. Now, the study yeah. found that the polygenic index accounted for a significant number of genetic variances in the post Soviet group. And even in your book, I do remember um, that you didn't go to say that shifts in women's um, access to education also had an effect mm -hmm. on the polygenic indexes related to women's education, uh, the educational outcome. So wouldn't then the opposite be true, um, meaning the social change and environmental change is having an effect ultimately on genes? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so, so again, I think this is back to you know, getting out of this mindset that it's either genes, nature, or nurture, and, and we're always talking about genes are operating through the environment and in interaction with the environment. So, you know, we can think about um, uh, that those two examples are great ones where you have a polygenic index that's associated with educational attainment. But if you live in a totalitarian regime or you're a woman in the early 20th century and you're literally not allowed to go to many colleges, it doesn't really matter what your genotype is, right? Like you could have all of the kind of education promoting um, uh, alleles, you know, that exist on earth, but there's no opportunity for them to be expressed because there's no opportunity to go in school. And that's not a sign that the genetic information is worthless. In fact, I think it's a sign that the genetic information is a really useful tool for, for seeing these types of contexts where the, the genome matters more or less. Where are the, you know, where do people, um, you know, where are there opportunities that um, expand differences between people because people are more able 
to, to take advantage of opportunities? Um, and also what are the type of contacts in which people who um, are very at risk are still doing really well? So I'll give you another example. We looked at this in terms of, and I write about this in the book, we looked at this in relation to math classes that students take. And what you see is that advantaged high schools in the US, they really buffer the students who have a low polygenic score from dropping out of math, right? Which is telling us something that fits with our other knowledge of how privilege works, right? That like there's this kind of um, glass floor where privileged kids, like it kind of doesn't matter if they have problems, they still don't fall beneath it because their environment is buffering them from, um, from kind of falling out of education in a certain way. So we also see that with genetics, that people who have you know, genetic variants that are associated with struggling in school don't struggle as much when they are in these kind of more advantaged, more well-funded um, uh, schools where, you know, everyone's on the college pipeline and it's not really a choice for them to like not take geometry, right? Like they're still going to stay in school. Um, so we're almost always looking at this interaction between nature and nurture. Now, let's switch a little bit to the topic uh, um, of eugenics, which you yeah. <laughs> on in the book. A light one. <laughs> light one. Yeah. The, now, the DNA and genes can shape or have an effect on our academic outcomes, our academic success, is quite a provocative premise. And perhaps simplifying your book in a sentence like that um, is a disservice to your work and to your research. But critics have called uh, your premise dangerous. So mm -hmm. what do you think that why do you think that attempting to draw correlations between genes and academic outcomes is met with such a critical response? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, mean, I really am asking the reader to do something um, difficult here, which is that, you know, we've talked about genetic difference, specifically genetic difference relevant to intelligence or education, um, anything academic, um, in one way for, you know, as, as I write in the book since Francis Galton. So, you know, 150 years essentially where there's kind of been two dominant strains of thought. And one of the, one kind of um, ideology was Galton's which is that genes are related to socioeconomic success. And so therefore those differences, those inequalities are natural. In Galton's view, we couldn't do anything about them. And um, if we wanted to bring around a, about a better or more equal society, we, we had to do that at the level of tinkering with people's reproduction, right? And this led to atrocities. I mean, in the U.S., we had involuntary sterilization of women who were alleged to be feeble-minded. Those were mostly poor women and women of color. Um, so, you know, there was a, a, an observation. People might differ with something related to heredity that matters for how they're faring under this, you know, kind of emerging capitalist society. Um, and then there was a series of sort of policy prescriptions around that, which was like, and therefore inequality is unfixable and it's natural and some people are naturally better than others and we can interfere with their reproductive autonomy. Um, the backlash to that has been one that really emphasizes genetic sameness, right? Like if you think about when Bill Clinton introduced the results of the Human Genome Project, he said, you know, we're equal under the law and humans are 99.9% .9 the same, right? And it's this linking of sameness with legal, political, moral equality. So what I'm asking for people to do is do neither one of those things and say, can we recognize genetic differences between people and then not say, okay, so that means some people are better than other people and there's nothing we can do about it, but actually do what we've done for other domains of biological difference, right? So, you know, in American society, we can say, for instance, well, maybe part of your sexual orientation is shaped by your biology. And that doesn't mean that one sexual orientation is inferior or superior to another. It's, this is a difference that exists and our society needs to recognize, accommodate that difference so that everyone can relate to each other as equals. We're, we're more accustomed to talking about different genetic really related difference or biological difference um, at the same time as, as, as value of quality when we're talking about genetic differences related to sexual orientation 
or mental illness, for instance, you know, it's very rare to meet someone today who thinks that like schizophrenia and depression are not influenced by your genes in some way. Um, what's been lagging is the conversation about genetics related to education. And I think the problem is not that, you know, really the problem isn't the idea that our bi biology influences how we do in school. I think it's that we've constructed such a hierarchy around school performance in the U.S., and, um, and so it's when people attach that hierarchical view of education to the genome, that's when we start to get into, to, uh, to problem. The, the solution to that isn't to deny that genetics matters for people's lives. It's to question our hierarchical view of, of how much people quote unquote deserve or merit on the basis of going further in school. So let's dismantle this idea that everything is a hierarchy of prestige based on education rather than ignoring the science about how genetics makes a difference for our lives. Now, let's assume that uh, there is an overall consensus and that, and that does happen. And the society gets yeah. behind the idea that, uh, of accepting that genetic variances predict um, um, educational outcome. The idea of, in gen of gene editing to impact education <laughs> is absurd. Yeah. As and I'm, yeah, and I'm not in any way advocating for that. So I want to okay. just jump in here and say that Americans on average already think that genes influence intelligence, academic achievement, school performance. Like if you ask lay sample, you know, non-scientists, lay samples of Americans, how much do genes influence these things? They almost never say zero. The average response is definitely not zero. So there's this weird knowing and unknowing. Americans already know this. There's just been no... Um, very little scholarship to help them make sense of what that means and how to reconcile it with some of their other moral and political values. Really, the only people who think that genes don't matter for education are some very highly educated academics, which is ironic in a way. Now, but then what can the field, specifically what can the field of genetics offer to inform practical aspects of our lives yeah. from social programs to policy or is it the role just to act merely as an observer of social change? Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing is just about, like, we like knowing things about human development, right? Like, part of science is doing basic research to learn more, and you never quite know how it's going to end up being ultimately useful. That being said, I think, you know, a major... Um, a major myth, misconception that gets in people's way here is this idea that there's genetic stuff here, and the only way to change it is through tinkering with people's biology, right? Like that if something is genetically caused, it has to have a genetic or biological solution. Um, and that's obviously not true, right? Like if you wear glasses, you have had a genetically caused differences in your functioning that we do not CRISPR your genes in order to fix your eyesight. We give you an environmental um, an intervention. I, you know, an example I talk about in the book is speech therapy, right? Speech pathology problems are very highly heritable in childhood. Um, we do not fix children who have a speech therapy problem by gene editing them. We send them to speech therapy, right? And we, we teach them how to do the things that come more easily to children who don't have genes that make them vulnerable to a speech and language development problem. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to do in clinical psychology and developmental psychology and education in, in um, economics and in policy evaluation is figure out what are the things I need to change in the environment that are going to be, that, that are going to cause the most consistent changes for the most for the most people, right? Like what are my most high priority um, targets for intervention research? Um, once you give up the idea that genetics causes can only be uh, uh, addressed using biological interventions and instead realize that genes can be a clue, a really valuable clue about the pathways of human development that can tell us about, well, where are the environments that we need to push on, right? And this is really intuitive when we're thinking about like drug development, right? So it's like, okay, I'm going to find this gene and it's associated with cancer. 
And I'm not going to then CRISPR someone's genes. What I'm going to do is figure out, well, the gene affects this pathway. And then I can intervene on this pathway using this drug. And that's going to be how I influence things. We are really used to that in medicine. What I'm trying to encourage people to do is broaden their imagination about how we can take that approach to the social sciences, right? So these genes affect your likelihood of smoking and drinking because they make you like hanging out with, um, uh, they change your personality and you really like friends who are more likely to, to, drop, you know, to, to use drugs or drink and smoke. Okay, so what can we do to intervene at the family level to intervene at that point? Well, let's send people to family therapy where parents are taught to monitor their adolescent's behavior. That changes the risk of alcohol use. And it also breaks that link between genes and drinking, um, not by changing anything about someone's genes, but by using the genes as a tool to identify where are the environments that need to be pushed on. Um, as we mentioned earlier, you lead the developmental behavior science, uh, sorry, uh, developmental behavior genetics lab, and yeah. you co-directed Texas Tune Project. Yeah. Did this book mark a milestone in your research and really what's next uh, for you? Yeah, and your team? yeah. So the book, you know, the book started out as a paper. <laughs> I thought I would write an academic paper that was going to be like 8,000 words long. <laughs> um and as I was writing it, I just realized that there's so, you know, it touches on so many issues, um, so many different conversations within academia, but that also, you know, it touches on things that people are curious about, even if they're not scientists, right? I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you, um, you know, I'm assuming some of the people watching this video are not professional scientists, and, but they're still interested in questions of genetics and identity and agency and equality and they're seeing all this information come out about what we can do with DNA technology right now. Um, and they don't necessarily know how to make sense of it. Um, and so a kind of the paper started to spiral and then someone approached me and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, no, but now I have. And so, you know, that turned into the book. Um, so now I'm really at the point of, you know, that now that the book is done, it's a little bit of a crossroads because like the book is finally out. I finally made full professor. Um, and there's a lot of different opportunities about where I could go next. And I'll be honest, I don't really know yet where I'm going. I feel like it's that kind of, um, that kind of pause where you're sort of assessing different possibilities and seeing, you know, where am I going to invest my efforts in the next you know, the next chapter of my work. So we'll see. If you ask me in six months, I'll probably have a better answer for that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll definitely hope to have you back to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, the, the book is called uh, The Genetic Lottery, uh, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality, and it is by Dr. Catherine Page Harden. Uh, we'll share a link to her bio so you can learn a little bit more about her and her work. Uh, Dr. Harden, it was a pleasure speaking with you, and we look yeah. forward to having you back. Yeah, thank you so much. This was fun. Radio. Nos proponemos ser la emisora online calificada para ser la mejor opción en comunicación para ustedes. Nos preparamos en noticias, deportes, cultura, música y de entretenimiento general para que usted esté conectado todo el tiempo con nosotros. Caribe Radio ofrece el mejor servicio de comunicación digital para que las empresas se hagan visibles a diferentes públicos. Desde lo público, trabajamos para el servicio y por el servicio social. Caribe Radio Online, nos entrenamos día a día para brindar la mejor opción en producción de medios digitales. Caribe Radio, la radio del futuro.